Hello. <laughs> welcome to our online audience and welcome to our in-person audience here in Bethesda, Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C. This is the monthly lecture of the National Capital Area Skeptics, NCAS, also known as NCAS. I'm Scott Snell, NCAS president. Thanks for joining us today. We're in our 35th year of these public lectures. As advocates for science and reason, we promote the scientific method, rational inquiry and education. In a way, it's remedial education for a misinformed public. For example, large segments of the public think that some UFOs might be alien spacecraft or psychic powers might be real, and so on. The ability to engage the public on these topics of interest and to re reveal the truth behind the clickbait is a great way to educate the public. To enable them to think critically about all sorts of topics, whether scientific or otherwise, we offer an antidote to the nonsense promoted by much of the news media and many publishers. Well, today we have a no-nonsense topic. Mass extinctions, the end of the world. <laughs> you might be wondering, wait, you're, it's the holiday season and you're talking about the end of the world. What's that got to do with the holiday season? Well, this is a season of gift giving. And we have an awesome speaker for you today. So think of it as us giving you a gift and that does fit in with the uh, holiday spirit. Our, our speaker is Thomas Holtz Jr. Principal Lecturer in Vertebrate Paleontology at the Department of Geology, University of Maryland, College Park. He's also a research associate of the Department of Paleobiology of the Smithsonian Institution, National Museum of Natural History. His research focuses on the origin, evolution, adaptations, and behavior of carnivorous dinosaurs, especially Tyrannosaurus rex and other Tyrannosauroids. He's a consultant on music, I'm sorry, museum exhibits around the world, on numerous documentaries, author of award-winning popular science books, and the current editor of the Life of the Past series at Indiana University Press. He'll be speaking to us today about mass extinction events and what causes them. Ladies and gentlemen, Thomas Holtz. All right. Great. So has sound working fine? Awesome, good. So yeah, I'm gonna take off my mask. Everyone in person here is far enough away. It should be fine. This is weird to be lecturing without a mask. Um, <laughs> even, even in person teaching, I'm, I'm wearing a mask because if my students have to wear the mask throughout the entire lecture, I feel I should, but this is a different situation. Uh, so yeah, as, um, as I said, I'm here to talk about mass extinction. So ho, 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 um, death and destruction. Uh, <laughs> come on in. Um, so I'm going to begin by talking about uh, what are extinctions and mass extinctions. Um, and then we're going to move on to looking at some of the big mass extinctions in the history of life, the so-called Big Five. Um, and then some general aspects of these phenomena. Uh, and then wrap it up by thinking about the implications of mass extinctions for contemporary society, or well, contemporary and future society, um, and, and humanity in general. So first of all, what are extinctions? and mass extinctions. Well, extinction itself is pretty straightforward. Uh, and depending upon what flavor of life scientist you are, you might finesse it slightly differently. Um, so a traditional biologist, and this would include you know, organismal biologists like zoologists, and as well as you know, we paleontologists and so forth. And it's when the last member of a species or an entire clade, that is an entire branch of the tree of life, dies out. So there's no more of that kind anymore. Uh, a geneticist might think about it when the genome is no longer being passed on. So it's, it's sort of an information approach rather than an organism approach. And to an ecologist, it might be when the species range or the clade range goes to zero. They're no longer occupying space in the ecosystem. But they all mean the same thing. There ain't no more of them. Um, and the reality of extinction is something that, uh, that natural philosophers and other thinkers were coming to grips with in the 1600s and afterwards because they saw it happening in real time. So uh, the, the creature here is a dodo, an extinct form of flightless pigeon from the island of Mauritius, um, which died out in the 1600s as a byproduct of the colonization of those islands. Um, to some degree, there was actual human hunting of them, but much more of them uh, much more of the population died out because of the in accidental introduction of rats and the intentional introduction of pigs. Mm -hmm. 
to the island, um, eating out their eggs, uh, transforming the ecosystem. So people were becoming aware of the possibility of extinction by the 1600s. But the reality of natural extinctions took a little longer. Um, in part, it had to do with the fact that people hadn't really grasped what rocks were. Without understanding what rocks are, then we don't have a geologic record and we don't have a record of ancient time. And there would be no reason to think that the world has been different than it is now. But as people began to grasp that rocks are records of ancient times and that these fossils in them are the remains of once living creatures, um, then they could begin to examine these creatures in detail. And by the late 17 and early 1800s, you had some of the first serious comparative zoologists and comparative botanists, people like Georges Cuvier here, um, who could examine these remains and show that this thing that's called a, a mastodon is not a modern elephant. It is distinct from any living elephant. That these cre this set of jaws down here are not the jaws of a crocodile or a whale like modern animals, but as a giant seagoing lizard, um, and so on and so forth. So Cuvier and others began to establish the reality of natural extinctions. Uh, but Cuvier and his colleagues went even further than that. Um, by combining this growing science of stratigraphy, of reading the geologic column, representing the sequence of events through time, and the census of the organisms that lived at each of these layers, he became aware that, and others, that there wasn't one prehistoric world. There was not one fossil age. Uh, what all the ancient creatures lived, but rather that there was a succession of fossil ages. And that as we start, you know, from geologically young organisms that are rather similar to the ones of today and earlier ones were more distinctly different and so on and so on, going further and further back through time. Cuvier and some of his colleagues went even further and they noticed discontinuities in this distribution of forms through time. That you would have, for instance, layers where Coiled aminoids were common in the seas uh, where chalk was being deposited uh, and where strange reptiles were in the seas and in the air and eventually discovered on land. And then the next set of strata above those lacked all those creatures. And we had primitive mammals of various sorts and more modern style plants. And Cuvier, who himself as a, as a nobleman who had lived through the French Revolution, uh, knew that revolutions could be profoundly transformative events in history, uh, referred to these as, as geological revolutions and perceived them as being the transformation of life um, due to perhaps some form of catastrophe. Um, however, there were alternative schools of thought um, and some championed, particularly by, by uh, British scientists like Charles Lyell and, um, and Charles Darwin, was that the discontinuities here represents gaps in time, that there were long periods missing, and that's what made them look so, so different from each other, and that if we had a more complete geologic record, we would have seen a continuous, slow, gradual change from one state to another. That's going on on the one hand. Other people were looking at the issues of the census of data of fossils throughout geologic time. Uh, in sort of a slightly different context, but these eventually would dovetail, dovetail together. Um, and this is work by John Phillips, a British scientist of the mid-1800s, who was taking a census of the more common marine invertebrate, that is shellfish fossils, throughout different slices of geologic time, and noticing uh, a couple major patterns. First of all, the dashed line here, which I've redrawn from his original figure, represents the number of known species that existed at any time. So that would be from zero here to whatever the maximum is over here. And geologic time getting older with depth, which is the way the rocks form. And seeing that it's generally increasing over time, but there are these great dips in the total number of forms known at different time slices. Additionally, by looking at the categories of shellfish that were being found in these different layers, and here is the same data, but broken up by group and rescaled to 100% at each time, that these discontinuities or these drops in diversity reflect changes in the overall makeup of the major groups at the time. 
And these are what we would now refer to as mass extinctions, although that term is, would be anachronistic for the, the 1800s. It's a term from the 20th century. Um, and these were used, in fact, by Phillips to break up the history of life into large chunks. And in fact, it's from this paper that the Cenozoic, Mesozoic, and Paleozoic eras were defined. And they were defined by these mass extinction events. I think it's, it's interesting and curious, other people have noted this too, that in fact, Phillips picked up two other smaller diversity drops in this data, and it turns out those actually represent two more of the big five mass extinctions. And the reason he didn't get the earliest of the big five mass extinctions is he didn't have enough data from down in this part of the record. Um, so we make our way to the 20th century, and the rise of radiometric dating allows us to actually start putting some hard numbers on the ages of rocks. And it demonstrates that folks like Charles Lyell and Charles Darwin were just plain wrong. That you couldn't explain the big discontinuities of diversity by gaps in time. There wasn't enough missing time to explain it as being a, sort of an epiphenomenon of the loss of large chunks of time. There were very rapid changes in the diversity of life. And so we move our way to the 1970s and 80s and the use of a new set of equipment called a computer um, and larger, much larger databases than, um, than Phillips and his colleagues uh, even dreamed of. Um, and the ability to try to pin down statistically the rates of extinction through time. So this is the work of Raup and Sapkowski um, in the uh, mid-1970s where they're showing extinction rate over here versus geologic time from oldest to youngest over here. And they found there is a background level of extinction, um, that there are things going extinct throughout Earth history. No one actually ever truly doubted that. But that there were events which statistically stuck out um, as dramatically different from the background. And these are what they refer to as mass extinctions. And in fact, it would be in the 1980s uh, only in the 1980s, that mass extinction actually got a formal definition, although the term had been kicked around since the mid-20th century. So Jack, Jack, uh, Jack Sapkowski defines a mass extinction as any substantial increase in the amount of extinction, that is lineage termination, suffered by more than one geographically widespread higher taxon, this group of organisms, during a relatively short interval of geologic time, resulting in an at least temporary decline in their standing diversity. So let's take that uh, part one by one here. So first of all, it occurs over a geologically short period of time. It need not be instantaneous, uh, but it has to be a, sh a relatively short interval, which in this context is on a few million years or less. It has to include the loss of entire geographically widespread groups. So you can't refer to a mass extinction in South America. It, it's a uh, geographically widespread or globally widespread groups. It has to be uh, not just a single group or a few groups, but many groups with different ecological niches, different ways of life, and from many different parts of the tree of life. So you'll hear people sometimes refer to the mass extinction of amphibians going on. That is incorrect. They are not undergoing a mass extinction, although as we'll see, maybe we're on the early days of a mass extinction. You can't have a mass extinction in amphibians because amphibians is just one group. Mm -hmm. um, it can still be an extinction. It can still be a phenomenon we should be concerned about, but that doesn't mean it's a mass extinction. Similarly, the, um, the case of the loss of large-bodied mammals and to some degree large-bodied ground birds, and well, some flying birds and reptiles in the last couple uh, tens of thousands of years is not a mass extinction either. That's a relatively restricted group relatively restricted ecologically. Mass extinctions include things like everything from reef formers to plankton to bottom dwellers to uh, forest organisms to giant animals to tiny animals and plants and so forth. So it's very, very broad. And the mass extinction has to result in an overall decrease in life's diversity for some period of time afterwards. There's always this background extinction going on and normally, as that's going on, you're replacing one form with a slightly different 
form that's doing essentially the same thing ecologically. Mass extinction sort of clear house in terms of the ecology. And it takes a while for life to reestablish um, that mode of life. Something that survived has to eventually evolve to occupy that ecological mode of life. Now, depending on the way you look at those data, um, there seem to be five major mass extinctions. That said, slightly different statistics and slightly different ways of calculating um, what organisms and what level of organisms you're putting into your analysis might get six or seven of the big ones or might reduce it to uh, four or three. But it's become sort of a cultural meme to refer to the big five. And here they are. And I'm going to talk about them in a little more detail coming up. But these are not the only large extinctions. These are just the ones that really stand out. And so here is a, uh, from a paper from 2006 showing extinction rates at the genus level over time. Um, some of them qualifying as mass extinctions due to the uh, diversity decline in others and others not so much. And here's from a different paper. Uh, on this one, the members of the big five are here, 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 not that one, <laughs> here, and here. Oh, sorry, uh, uh, and, uh, yeah, so N Triassic, um, N Devonian, and Cretaceous, late Devonian, those two are part of one of the standard big five. Uh, this one sometimes is included with the largest of them. Or yet another way of looking at it, and we get, uh, well, here are the big five through here, but we see some are sort of cl closing in on them. Um, and additionally, most of this work has been done looking at marine organisms. It's because the fossil record of marine organisms is much more complete a much more continuous um, and far better studied. Um, but the terrestrial record shows some, but not all, of these mass extinction events. So that's a little background about what is a mass extinction. So what causes mass extinctions? According to this museum exhibit, it's lifting that lever. So hopefully they have tied it down and they don't let anyone lift it anymore so we don't get any more mass extinctions. No. Um, when we talk about what causes a mass extinction, well, with almost any historical phenomenon, what causes anything? You gotta, you gotta sort of clarify what you mean by that. I mean, the cliche, you know, World War I was started by the assassination of uh, Archduke Ferdinand, and it was a, an event that was important, but had other socio-political factors not been at play, the assassination of one particular Archduke wouldn't have plunged Europe and eventually other parts of the world into war. So. That's a, that can be a semi-tricky question when we're talking about some historical phenomena. That said, uh, we're often intrigued by discovering a causal agent, a trigger, the thing that causes a mass extinction to happen then rather than some other moment in time. So this could be like an asteroid impact or an intense ice age or a super volcano event or something. But rarely is it the direct effects of an asteroid or an ice age or super volcanoes that kill the organisms. Uh, instead, they produce sets of phenomena, killing agents that wind up killing organisms, whether it's, you know, hypotherm uh, it's a, a reduced temperature or infalling debris or blocking sunlight or what have you. And then there's some sort of killing mechanism, the actual physiological change, hypothermia hypercapnia, which is too much CO2, hypoxia, too little oxygen, et cetera, that actually does the final deed. Now, there's a, a big industry of people trying to identify potential causal agents. Um, and that's cool. You know, we want people to generate multiple working hypotheses that we can study. The problem is, for events like this, um, was a giant, you know, uh, ecosystem ending events, people have a habit of trying to find the most alluring or spectacular or wonderful in the sense of wonder, you know, uh, phenomena possible, and yet that might not be the best approach. Um, and so we want to identify reasonable causal agents. So first of all, we want agents that are actually capable of generating an extinction. One would think this would be the first level that you do, but over time people have talked about, for instance, uh, the rise of caterpillars as 
wiping out the dinosaurs. And the logic goes like this. Caterpillars appear sometime during the Cretaceous. Um, well, butterflies, including caterpillars, uh, appear during the Cretaceous. They eat all the plants, and the herbivorous dinosaurs die. But this fails on all sorts of levels. First of all, yes, butterflies appear in the Cretaceous. But the Cretaceous is not a tiny little chunk of time. The Cretaceous is longer than everything that has happened since the Cretaceous. The Cretaceous is 15 million years longer than the age of mammals. So something that occurred tens, and tens of millions of years before the event at the end is unlikely to have caused the event. Uh, secondly, the extinction at the end of the Cretaceous is not the extinction of dinosaurs. They're just part of the whole scenario. It involves all sorts of things, and it seems unreasonable to assume that little caterpillars munching on leaves is going to affect chalk-making organisms in the shallow sea and so forth. On the flip side, there is a tendency, primarily among astrophysicists and geophysicists, but I ain't naming names, to come up with um, ideas of overkill, things which are sufficient to kill things, but the problem is things that should have killed everything, and that didn't happen. And if you're an uncertain that, if you're uncertain about that, if you're uncertain, did everything die out of that event? An experiment. Take your pulse. Do you have a pulse? If you have a pulse, then no, everything didn't die because your ancestors survived every one of the mass extinction events throughout history. There was mass survivorship as well. Every living thing afterwards is the descendant of an organism that survives a mass extinction event. So some people will come up with these gloriously wonderful ideas of like gamma ray bursters near to the solar system, which indeed could produce a mass extinction, but you know should have taken us down to maybe a bacterial level. And then there would have to be a whole new evolution of multicellular, in fact, of eukaryotic life. And that didn't happen. So, and this is a critical one to approach it scientifically. The phenomenon has to be identifiable from evidence independent of the extinction event itself. If it's going to be a, a potentially useful uh, idea of a causal agent, it should at least explain the extinction, but we should also be able to find some sort of evidence independent of the loss of life. Um, that shows us that that thing was at play, that that thing existed at that time in the world. So some sort of independent geological or geochemical or whatever evidence. All right. So now we take a brief view of the, uh, the big five mass extinctions, um, many of which you don't hear too much about in the general um, discussion of, of you know, popular science because, let's face it, they're, they're kind of weird and they involve organisms most of us haven't heard of. So we're going to start it, we're going to run it in stratigraphic order. So we'll start with the late Ordovician and we'll wind up with the end, the end of the Cretaceous. So the Ordovician Silurian extinctions. Um, this occurs around 444 million years ago. Oh, by the way, M -A, capital M, little a is millions of years ago, standard uh, geological abbreviation. Uh, the marine communities of the world are devastated by, by this. I'll say the terrestrial communities of the world were not devastated by this because there weren't really terrestrial communities le yet. Land plants existed only in their most simple form at the time. There's not even good evidence that the arthropods, the bugs, had made it on land permanently yet. Um, so it's sort of, you know, by saying marine communities devastated, I could also say organismal communities devastated. It does coincide with the first major ice age of the Phanerozoic Eon, of the age of animals. Um, and that may uh, play a role done uh, under some of the models. Um, why would that happen? Why would Ice Age, which, predict, which primarily affects, if we th think about it, primarily affects the land in terms of its environmental factors, be important for the marine realm? Well, the ice comes from somewhere, and what it comes from is the ocean or the majority of it comes from the ocean. Water evaporates out of the sea, snows on land, and gets uh, accumulated as glacial ice. So when the ice grows, sea level drops. It's a common phenomenon in the history of the Earth. Well, when you reduce the amount, when you reduce the sea level, you're shrinking the amount of space in the shallow marine community. And as I'll talk about in a, in a bit, there's a common factor in ecology that when habitat range uh, decreases, the number of species that that habitat can support decreases. 
That said, there is evidence, <coughs> recent evidence, that um, there is some extreme vulcanism at the very end of the Ordovician. And a paper out just a couple weeks ago suggests that this might involve fertilizing the seas, which could have produced dead zones comparable to some of those dead zones that form uh, around the continents today as a byproduct of human agricultural and industrial activity. The second of the big mass extinctions is much more strongly associated with that sort of fertilization effect, so I'll talk about that in more detail there. But just to show you uh, a little of the data here, so this is the diversity of life uh, of marine organisms in terms of genera, so a genus is the step above a species. And we see this crash down right here in the late Ordovician. Uh, and it is associated with this big sea, sea surface temperature drop, which is associated with the Ice Age going on. Now, that cooling in and of itself might have been important. Uh, but as I mentioned, it, it is also a marker of the fact that you have major glaciation, which is going to reduce the species, the area that species can occupy. Um, and as I mentioned, it's a standard observation in ecology that the area of a habitat um, is related to the number of species it can support. So when that area decreases, it supports fewer species. And if you're decreasing all that habitat, like all the shallow shelf space in the world, um, there's no place for those organisms to run, so to speak. So even when the shelf expands, again, it's not like new species will appear automatically. They have to evolve, and that takes time. All right. Now, the next of the big five mass extinctions is probably two mass extinctions, and they wouldn't, if we split it in two, they may or may not make it to the big five. This is one of the ones that really makes the counting a little curious. Uh, and they both occur in the later part of the Devonian period. So here are the dates here, about 372 and about 359. Um, in fact, they bracket one of these smaller time units here. So this is the end of the Devonian period, so earlier, later. Um, so there's an extinction here and an extinction here. And here's another way of looking at it. Um, these sort of spindle shapes show the number of, is it genera on this? Of families, so even higher level, um, of organisms. In this case, these two are branches of the sea scorpion group, and these are various sorts of fish. And we see at this dashed line, that's the first of them, and we see a decline in a lot of groups there, and then even more so uh, at the second phase. Um, the late Devonian extinctions are, like the, like the Ordovician Silurian one, also not particularly well known in the public's eye. Um, they're not as well studied as the later three. But this is one for which there's actually some pretty good evidence of a trigger, and sort of an unusual trigger. In the late Devonian, we saw the rise of the first of the big rainforests and the first time that the continental interiors were being colonized by seed plants, plants that don't require spores in terms of reproduction. And the advantage of a seed plant is it can grow in a drier climate. Well, a consequence of that is that the world's first big soils are being made, and there's also lots of now plant matter that's making its way down through the streams out to the shallow seas um, as just an ordinary part of transportation. And this may well uh, have triggered um, eutrophication. So eutrophication is a phenomenon a lot of us know in, in environmental sciences and ecology and so forth. And it's normally phrased today, it, it's agricultural or industrial waste products wash out to sea. Uh, they fertilize the plankton there, the phytoplankton. The phytoplankton bloom. You think that must be great, except they, after they bloom, they die. They're not eternal. They sink down to the seafloor. And the process of decay is a heterotrophic process. That is, it uses up oxygen. And so where you get a lot of decay on the seafloor, the oxygen gets sucked up, and the organisms that inhabit the shallow sea um, tend to die out. And in the modern world, we talk about these as dead zones. Um, now, it turns out much of the extinction in terms of the marine realm in the late Devonian occurs with the big reef complexes. The reefs of the, of the Devonian period were some of the biggest reef complexes in the history of life. And just as today, there's a huge amount of biodiversity in the reefs. Um, and we actually see a phenomenon similar to this today, where we have 
parts of the world where there's a lot of ecotourism around uh, coral reef complexes, um, people will build hotels. Hotels have waste products that come out of them because there's people in them. You got more people there, more waste products coming out. It tends to fertilize the sea. You get the blooms of algae and it tends to kill off the reefs, which is why people, they were trying to get people out there in the first place. So it's a problem. Um, and the similar sort of thing going on here, it appears that runoff from the land in terms of plant matter and other organic material generated directly or indirectly by the plants is running off to the sea and generating, this is benthic anoxia, so bottom water anoxia. Um, so in some ways, even if the uh, late Ordovician and the late Devonian mass extinctions were better known to the public, I think they probably still wouldn't get that much attention because it doesn't look to be super dramatic. I mean, an ice age is kind of dramatic, but plant runoff, not really. Um, don't worry, the next three ones have a lot of drama. <laughs> so the next one is the biggie, the, by far the most intense mass extinction in the history of animals. Uh, and that's the Permo-Triassic extinction, the one between the boundary between the Paleozoic era and the Mesozoic era at around 252 million years. So here's data of uh, species of marine organisms, marine invertebrates, um, from, in this case from China, go, running from the beginning of the Phanerozoic to this line here, that's the end of the Paleozoic, and that's the very beginning of the Triassic. And we can see that in terms of the diversity of species, the Permo-Triassic extinction is a cliff face. It just crashes down. Uh, and by comparison, this is the pulses of the late Devonian, and there's the line for the uh, Ordovician Silurian. So far more drastic, dramatic than the previous two. This is one for which we've known the causal agent for some time. And it's an outcrop of, well, it is a, a, a volcanic, eruption or series of eruptions to which the name Siberian Traps has been given. Now traps in this context is from, um, it's a Dutch, I believe a Dutch word, uh, related to, well I mean steps, like stair steps. And they're so called not because they're trapping anything, but because when these lava flows erode away, they look like stair steps. As the name suggests, they're from Siberia. In fact, here is a map showing sort of in dashed line the extent uh, of these deposits. And here's um, another map showing uh, the preserved extent of the deposits now. And given the vast size of, you know, of Russia, you could see that this is a, a phenomenal amount of material. In fact, if you were to take the total volume that erupted from this, uh, this event and took it to North America and sort of evenly traveled it over North America, it would bury North America up to about 400 feet. So it's a lot of lava that erupted in the space of about a million years. So this is a tremendously rapid, uh, very fluid eruption coming out of the Earth. But it's not the lava itself that would have been the primary uh, causal agent or tr killing agent for, uh, for much of the world. I mean, obviously creatures living in ancient Siberia wouldn't like it, but uh, instead, this sort of what's called flood basalt eruption. Basalt is a particular sort of uh, igneous rock. It's a rock that the Galapagos and Hawaii and so forth are made out of. Um, flood, because this is such a liquid flow, it just blanketed vast regions. But it wasn't single craters. Rather, it was a series of fissures over a vast region. And it turns out that the heat coming up that's generating this lava actually went through both um, coal seams, relatively, at the time, relatively young coal seams in Russia. So those burst into flames, and so we're adding CO2 into the eruption, and through uh, sea salt deposit, rock salt deposits that had been formed, again, actually not terribly much earlier than this, and so releasing uh, chlorides into the atmosphere. And so you know, here's a typical day in Russia in, uh, in the end of the, end of the Paleozoic. Estimates suggest as much as 170,000 gigatons of carbon, mostly as carbon dioxide, were released. For comparison, the modern atmosphere contains about, what's that, 807, oh, it was 873 gigatons of carbon, again, mostly as CO2. And 
the pre-industrial level for us was about 600. So all the global warming that's happened so far, all the emissions from industry so far has released 273 gigatons, and we're talking about 170,000 gigatons, and 18,000 gigatons of hydrochloric acid. Uh, and a tremendous amount of sulfur gases as well. That's less of a surprise. It's a common byproduct of a lot of eruptions. Um, in fact, it looks like the sulfur aerosols produced by the eruption would have been the first thing um, to affect the Earth. And we've seen this in, in volcanic eruptions in more recent times. Um, when Pinatubo erupted, the, sulfate, uh, the, 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 the sulfur uh, compounds formed sulfur aerosols in the atmosphere, which cooled um, the atmosphere, the, gold, cooled the surface temperature, uh, for about a year or so afterwards. Well, in this case, the estimates are that the sulfur aerosols had a 10 to 15 centigrade degree temperature drop worldwide for at least a decade and possibly vastly longer. Um, and that's pretty chilling. In fact, that is more difference between before and after in terms of a temperature drop than between today's temperature and the peak of the last ice age. Now, this isn't long enough to be an Ice Age event per se, but it would be a chilling event. Uh, but one thing that the sulfur aerosols did, at least, was decrease the sunlight uh, from warming the ground too much, because once the sulfur rained out of the atmosphere, how would it rain out? As acid rain. Um, then we have worse problems, because the world experienced the most extreme greenhouse warming that it has probably had in the age of animals something like an octupling of atmospheric CO2. So I mentioned that huge amount of, of, of carbon that was released. Of course, that was released over the space of a million years. So at no point was all of that expressed in the atmosphere simultaneously. But still, tremendous high levels. In fact, it suggests that the temp global temperature was about 45 degrees C. Uh, that's 113 Fahrenheit degrees. That's the temperature of the western desert of Australia. Um, and that's pole-to-pole -pole temperature. By contrast, today's global average temperature is 15.6 degrees. Um, also, the CO2 released in the atmosphere is going to mix with the shallow ocean water to produce ocean acidification. And that tiny bit of CO2 that we've released, well, tiny relative to this, is already producing ocean acidification effects today. This is a far stronger ocean acidification effect. But wait, there's more. Uh, because with the extremes that are being subjected, both to phytoplankton and plants, there's a global drop in atmospheric level. That's the mass death of the plants and the phytoplankton, so they're not actually producing a lot of O2. And uh, some models suggest that sea surface oxygen levels were something comparable to what had been you know, several kilometers up in the mountain uh, immediately beforehand. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Because ocean anoxia promotes the, gro the growth of sulfur bacteria. So adding more sulfur back into the atmosphere as bursts of hydrogen sulfide. I should point out actually a former um, grad student um, at our department actually had some of the first good evidence of this, of this particular part of it. The oceans went sulfitic, that is overly enriched in sulfur, which is really nasty for the tissues of some marine organisms. Also, as gases, hydrogen sulfide destroys the ozone layer. And there's actually evidence that it did back then as well. Malformed pollen has been found uh, in many parts of the world at the boundary layers. And these fossil pollen malformations closely match those produced by comparable plants, so plants of groups that were present at the time and that are still with us, that have been irradiated with UV. Um, and we see the same sorts of things. So that's not so much fun. Oh, then, of course, all that acid rain coming down, that's not good for things either. So um, depending upon where you were in the oceans or on land, varying levels of, um, of acid rain, of increased uh, ultraviolet radiation. And it's not surprisingly uh, that this event is sometimes called when life nearly died, although that's an exaggeration. You know, animals, maybe. Um, plants, they weren't doing well. Uh, but no, bacteria were doing fine. <laughs> Bacteria are life, too. No, but this is one of the most devastating events in the history of, of multicellular organisms, both in the oceans and on land. But, as with all of them, there was a recovery. And so various organisms make their way back. 
uh, as I, I sometimes joke with my students, the, uh, your nature, the, the shortest nature field guide in the history, at least of the last 300 million years, would be like earliest Triassic field guide, because it's like three species, not that bad. There would have still been hundreds and hundreds of species around, but there'd be relatively few, but very common ones, the ones that survived the best. But over the next 50 million years, life recovered. We get the beginning of the age of reptiles. Uh, dinosaurs appeared. Their, uh, their, their cousins, the ancestors of the crocodiles, were doing even better than the dinosaurs. The first mammals appeared. And then you replay the same event 50 million years later. Um, at the boundary between the tri Triassic and Jurassic period, there's another mass extinction event, which has many similar attributes in terms of of the environmental effects, and that's because the triggering agent is very similar, and it's one that's not terribly far from us here. Um, it's a period of volcanism that's uh, expressed among such things as the Palisades uh, of the Hudson region, um, the igneous rocks that are found in Gettysburg and that region, and in fact, most of the reddish rocks you see running from the Carolinas up to uh, Nova Scotia and Newfoundland, basically near to the uh, I-95 corridor and its equivalent in Canada, represent an expression of this event. Uh, and it represents the breakup, the initial breakup of the supercontinent of Pangaea. Uh, as we see, here we go, the, um, so here's North America, South America, Africa, and Europe. And along this margin here, which will eventually be the Central Atlantic region, so separating North America and Europe on one side from South America and Africa on the other, you get this pulling apart, very similar to what we see going on in Eastern Africa today, the Great Rift Valley of Africa. Only this one didn't stop. Well, that's not the one in Africa hasn't stopped either. It may eventually be a new ocean. And as it's tearing apart, we're getting huge upwelling of lava, given the name the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, or CAMP. And Camp turns out to be the second largest outpouring of lava in the age of animals, second only to the Deccan Traps. And so here's looking at scale and the size of LIP, its large igneous province. There's Siberian Traps and there's Camp, um, just for scale. Um, also, this is al also scaled to craters, but we're not, we haven't got to craters yet. We'll get to craters soon. And so the, the effects are similar to what we saw in the, um, at the um, Siberian Traps eruption. Outbursts of CO2, outbursts of uh, hydrogen sulfide, um, ma uh, mass asphyxia in the ocean. Um, it's pretty much the same environmental effects on a little smaller scale. So it's a smaller mass extinction, but it's pretty intense. And in fact, there's even evidence that there was a cold pulse at the beginning of the camp eruptions, just as there was with the Deccan Traps. Now, so there we got super, super volcanoes, or super duper volcanoes, if you will. But then there's the mass extinction that everyone knows about. <laughs> and that's the Cretaceous Paleogene event of 66 million years ago. You may know it as 65 million years ago, but that was recalibrated. Um, long story short, um, the cheap and easy way of doing radiometric dates turned out to be underestimating dates by like almost a percent when compared to a much more well-established but much more expensive to do uranium lead dating. And so when they recalibrated that, then everything sort of steps down a little bit. Um, you may also know of this as the Cretaceous tertiary extinction or KT extinction. Uh, the term tertiary is an outdated term from stratigraphy. We used to use it. It's been replaced by the Paleogene and Neogene periods instead. So technically, this is the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction. Um, now, it is true. There is a large outpouring of lava that is associated with this time. It's called the Deccan Traps. It's in western India. And in fact, here are photographs of, of the mountains in question that are representing some of this. And they do coincide with the extinction, not exactly at the extinction. They started earlier. They started about um, 300 thousand years beforehand. There's a big pulse shortly before the extinction, uh, but still thousands of years before, and a rather big pulse not too long after the extinction itself. And it could be, they, they would have definitely have affected the world's environment. And in fact, when we look on the opposite side of the world here, and in this case, um, North Dakota, the red is an estimate of 
local temperatures in North Dakota. And we see that the temperatures were around between 8 and 10 degrees mean annual temperature, and that's centigrade, in the early part of the age of Tyrannosaurus rex. So Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops are the dinosaurs, famous dinosaurs in these rocks. And then it bumps up by several degrees to where it's about 14, 15, 16 for a while. That is probably the effect of the carbon dioxide that's being erupted out of the Deccan traps. Now, maybe we would have had a mass extinction if it was just the Deccan traps. Could have been. It's a much smaller eruption, so it would have been probably a smaller mass extinction. And even if there was a mass extinction, it wouldn't be the extinction we saw in our history. Because that has another causal agent that's very well understood and uh, was discovered um, in sort of a curious fashion. Um, Walter Alvarez, uh, a geologist from um, UCAL Berkeley, was trying to answer the question, how much time is represented by that layer of clay? That was the question he was trying to answer. And that's, that's the thing. And it shows how, like, how great basic science can be. Um, this, this clay layer here in Gubbio, Italy, in the Tuscany region, um, separates rocks of the very latest Cretaceous and the very earliest Paleogene, or tertiary, as they would have said at the time. And um, he wanted to know how much time that clay layer was. You couldn't use radiometric dating. First of all, these are sedimentary rocks, which the radiometric dating wouldn't work. You couldn't use magnetic dating because there's no magnetic flip-flop that coincides with the boundary. It begins about 300,000 years before that. And then it flips again ten, uh, hundreds of thousands of years later. You couldn't use um, biostratigraphy, index fossils, because they already knew they had latest Cretaceous index fossils here and earliest Paleogene index fossils there. So what could you do? And like a lot of people who are stumped trying to figure out how to answer your homework, he went to his dad. It helps when your dad is a Nobel Prize winning physicist, Louis Alvarez, who had worked on the Manhattan Project, um, who had been involved in the nuclear weapons program for the uh, decades afterwards, and in, in particular, did a lot of study of the yield of some of the stronger weapons, and how you could relate the size of the crater for the uh, yield of the weapons. Then got um, worked for NASA, also on cratering, uh, because with lunar exploration, uh, try to understand how, how large was an object that would create a given crater on the moon. Um, and so the two of them talked together and said, what we, should, what we need to do is look for a tracer, something that's coming in at an average rate all the time into the Earth's system, and then take a look at that clay layer and divide the average flux rate by the amount observed there, and that will naturally give us how much time that clay layer was. And in consultation with a couple of their colleagues who were chemists, they decided on the metal iridium, which is very rare on the Earth's surface, which is always raining down at a certain rate due to... Um, due to meteorites hitting the Earth's atmosphere. And I thought, okay, this is great. And they did their sampling, and they ran the experiment, and they said, did we do something wrong? Because they had so much iridium concentrated on that layer that if you divided that by the average flux rate, there should have been millions, if not tens of millions of years missing, which they knew there weren't because they had the index fossils that show they weren't. So they said, okay, let's go back to our assumption. We were assuming average rate of infall, Maybe this wasn't average rate of infall. Maybe this was extraordinary rate of infall. And then I started thinking, OK, if it's extraordinary rate, how big are we talking? And they said, oh, wow. Because um, they worked out the, uh, the data. And it turns out that it's, you were required to hit the Earth with something like about a 10 to 15 kilometer diameter asteroid. So think Manhattan Island or Mount Everest, whichever is your go-to model, um, smacking into the Earth. And then they said, aha. You know, if only there was someone on our team who understood uh, the amount of energy relates to that impacting. Oh, wait, Alvarez. Uh, and they worked it out. Now. So something like 10 to the 18 megatons in terms of explosives. Uh, so like 1,000 to 10,000 World War III's, you know, if, if the uh, NATO and the Warsaw Pact fought it out at the peak of the Cold War 1,000 to 10,000 times at the same spot on the same day, uh, that's a lot of energy. And so over the course of the following um, decade or so, I should point out that this was about 1979 and 80 that they're doing this research, um, people began to understand the consequences of such an extraordinary event. Um, 
And there's two major short-term consequences and then a, a longer one. And none of these are the things that Hollywood really likes to show. Hollywood cares about the physical impact and the blast wave and the tsunamis. And those would have been devastating. And those would have caused the extinction of re a regional extinction. But they wouldn't necessarily have been mass extinction causers. And instead, it's the stuff that comes down right away and the stuff that stays up for a long time that have various effects. So first, the blast material that goes on the ballistic paths and come right back into the atmosphere um, heats up the surface of the planet. And some of the estimates suggest that the thermal pulse coming off the infalling material, if you were to hold your hand up, would be something like eight to 10 times the noon infrared you would feel at the equator. But this is everywhere. And organisms that can't get up and get out of the way, you know, like say big scaly reptiles or trees or things, are gonna bake. I like to refer to this as the easy bake oven effect. Mm -hmm. It's just sort of like an easy bake oven, you know, an easy bake oven um, doesn't get so hot that you can't have kids play with it. You know, it doesn't get hot as a real oven, but it's that thermal heat coming off of the, uh, the red lamp that bakes the, uh, the brownie. In this case, it's the thermal energy coming out of the sky that's baking animals primarily on the surface of the land. Things that are burrowers would be protected. Uh, things, or that can hide under a rock. Things that are in water are relatively protected. It basically boils off a micron or two. Um, and the air temperature generally doesn't heat up that much. It goes up 10 degrees or maybe, maybe more at some spots. Um, but for things that can't get out of the way, this is, this is not good. Additionally associated with that infalling debris, it looks like there's global forest fires at this time. So the ecosystem of the forest collapses. But the second phase here is what the Alvarez team was most concerned with in terms of a potential killing agent and probably was truly devastating. And that is the material that's blasted up and stays in the stratosphere blocks insulation, blocks incoming sunlight for many years, causing a, an impact winter. Um, and I'll show in a bit how, um, uh, how intense that impact winter could have been. And on top of all that, the spot that got hit was rich in carbonate rocks. It turns out the, the, the impact site is called um, Chicxulub. It's, a, it's in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. The limestones and dolomites there get vaporized. You oxidize carbonates. One of the byproducts is carbon dioxide, so there's a lot of extra CO2 left in the atmosphere, although it takes some time before that goes into play. And in fact, looking for the proxies, the material left behind by the impact, um, bullseyes <laughs> where the crater is. Um, so the thickest layers are tens of meters thick at the sites in purple, meters thick in the sites in red, centimeters thick at the sites in orange, and just millimeters thick in the yellows. And it's evidence like this that suggests people who, who want there to be another cratering site elsewhere would have to explain while they're not creating their own bullseye. <laughs> this data is consistent with a single major strike point. And so what were some of the effects? This is a, a simulation of the climate effects from the impact winter. So we're at six months now to the impact. We hit the impact and we get global cooling. It estimated global temperature drops of about 26 degrees for three to 16 years. And then it takes about 30 years before we get to recovery. Um, 26 degrees, again, that is vastly more intense than the chilling between now and the peak of the last ice age wouldn't be long enough this wouldn't have been long enough a period to generate giant continental glaciers but it would certainly suck for the creatures on the surface of the planet plus this darkness is going to cut off um it's going to cut off photosynthesis both on land and in the sea and that's what the alvarez team was most con uh, concerned with there that knocking out the base of the food chain is going to produce mass starvation but when the dust finally settles, literally finally settles, um, the higher levels of CO2 that's left over in the atmosphere causes a global warming event. It's been estimated uh, from data at various spots about five degrees C increase um, for about 100,000 years before, as nature typically does, nature does, will resorb that extra CO2 back into the Earth system. It always does, it just takes, you know, on the scale of tens to hundreds of thousands of years and not really something on our time scale. So 
leaving a world in which creatures that manage to survive again get to be the colonists of the new, new age. And unlike the other great mass extinction events, this is the work of a day. Now granted, the site of the aftermath takes a long time, but it's the work of a single day. It's Earth's worst day ever. And that means there's an anniversary of it. Um, now maybe it's Christmas time? We don't know, you know, there's a chance. This just in from earlier this week, from Wednesday, we do know what season it probably is. Um, and that is, it was boreal spring or summer. And the lines of evidence include, there's a, a wonderful site in North Dakota where we know that the deposit occurred at the day of the impact because among other things, there are fish uh, that use gill rakers on things like paddlefish and sturgeons and so forth. They've picked up the droplets that were on ballistic paths from Mexico in their gill rakers and died and are preserved with it in there. Um, and they show um, carbon and oxygen isotopic signatures that show that in their, their seasonal migration between freshwater and saltwater, that they were in the spring or summer mode. Also the baby fish from that site, uh, and these represent um, paddlefish, sturgeons, and bowfin fish are in the size range you would expect in terms of the overlap here in late spring or early summer. And additionally, some of the insect larvae that are preserved there are groups that are larvae in spring and early summer, but then are flying insects later in the year. This is really cool to be able to narrow it down. However, I do have to point out this is not mutually exclusive with the possibility that Christmas is the day. Because the seasons, the, the, the pattern of seasons changes on cycles of, a, of, of on the 100,000 year time scale. So take that 100,000 year time scale cycling back with our calendar and go back six, six, 66 million years. Maybe it's Christmas, we don't know. Um, now, one of the things that comes out with a lot of these mass extinction events is it looks like Many of them have like two or more major environmental effects and often in sort of opposite directions. Like many of these have an intense heat and an intense cool component. And it might be that that's a requirement for a truly big mass extinction. That creatures in order to survive have to survive all the different effects and sometimes mutually contradictory ones. So maybe some things go, whew, well, that impact winter, that sure, well, that, 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 that uh, easy pulse, uh, easy bake oven thermal pulse was really bad, but at least it's clearing out, oh wait, now it's getting really cold. Um, and so that's, uh, that seems to be perhaps one of the major factors. Additionally, in general, uh, it's probably not single points of failure in this. Uh, there's a, a concept in, in system science of system collapse. You know, whether we're talking about um, human societies, ecosystems, you know, economic systems or whatever, that if you've got complex systems, single points of failure may not be enough to take it down, but multiple stressed factors in the system might be sufficient to begin to bring part of it down, and then the loss of that element causes other things to collapse and so forth. And indeed, there are in Earth history even smaller scale events that do look at these a system collapse in environmental crises. But in general, the big pattern is a mass extinction happens when your rate of extinction is just a lot faster than the rate of origination. Uh, and so the diversity goes down. And as I like to say, it's something like the Game of Thrones. You either survive or you die. Um, you can't adapt to these events. They're occurring too severely and too quickly uh, for adaptation to work. You either happen to have, by circumstance, or by selection for some other reason, factors that make you favorable to surviving, or, or you don't survive. Um, and that these aren't extended over long enough a period of time that you can get a net selection to be more favorable to surviving these circumstances. Now, sort of towards the end of this, are we in the sixth extinction? There are people who've been referring to the sixth extinction for a couple decades now. There's a, a you know, Pulitzer Prize winning book here with that title. Um, we certainly are in a time of increased extinction. So here's a chart from the U.S. Geological Survey um, looking up through, was it 2015 data, I think? Um, and we do see the number of species extinctions uh, rocketing up, just as human populations have been rocketing up. And this shouldn't be that much of a surprise. Um, we are part of that uh, ecosystem, too, insofar as we are taking 
nutrients from the land, we occupy the land, and so forth. Um, you can't simultaneously have a whole bunch of us and not affect the world around us. The calories that we need are things we have to take from other creatures. Um, so it is, it is a consequence of that. Um, I do want to point out, however, that the counting of species here for the extinctions is not comparable to the counting of species in the fossil record. In the fossil record, we're seeing counts of organisms that are easily preserved, that have hard shells or bones or teeth, that are common enough to make their way into the fossil record and that we've actually recovered. Whereas this data includes all the sorts of data that hardworking ecologists and biologists around the world can find. So these include species whose entire population range is no bigger than this room, as well as much larger ones. So these counts, this is a far more comprehensive count in terms of species. And some people have tried to um, model what do our current extinction rates look like if we only looked at fossilizable taxa? And it's not as intense. It's not good, but it's not as intense. We can actually see patterns that have been going on over the last several thousands of years. Um, the extinctions at the end of the last ice age tended to be much larger animals. Those that have gone extinct in the last thousand years or so skew larger still, those that are th uh, larger than the ones that are not threatened. And the ones that are still with us but are in the threatened or endangered species list tend to skew larger than the ones that are not threatened. Not a surprise. And this is for mammals. Um, we do see diversity effects not only just on mammals. We see them in plants. We see them in insects. In fact, the insect database is one of the best ones uh, because, after all, there has been a long-term history of people collecting butterflies and beetles and so forth, and that citizen science actually winds up being really helpful in trying to understand current diversity patterns. Uh, it's somewhat worth noting that although the number of wild, in, uh, the biomass of wild mammals is much smaller today than it was pre-agriculture through extinctions, in fact, the total number of, uh, of mammals, the biomass of mammals is much higher, uh, and that's because we humans uh, and our livestock can be fed via agriculture. Agriculture is a way that we increase the productivity of the land. So as we're chewing up more of the surface of our earth for our own needs, we're producing more kilograms of mammals overall. It's just, it's a handful of species represented by this. So how intense is the current extinction event? Well, if we count the, spe the percentage of species that have actually gone extinct, um, in the last couple thousand years. Uh, it's tiny in terms of the percentage compared to the big five. So these are the big five. So that's the Permo-Triassic, Ordovician, Triassic, Jurassic, Late Devonian, and Cretaceous Paleogene. Um, and so we're looking at just a few percent here for the most part. If we were to look at every species that is currently on the um, endangered, threatened, or extremely threatened lists, and said that they go extinct, because after all, that's what they're endangered of. That still doesn't take it up to this level, uh, but it does certainly raise it up a bit more. So it puts the current event comparable to some of the not big five, but other rather big extinction events of Earth history. And one argument for the world actually being on the cusp of a sixth extinction is the fact that the types of organisms being affected now include basically everything. We have marine invertebrates, we have small terrestrial animals. It is a global and essentially simultaneous event. And so in that sense, it's comparable to the big five and not comparable to the loss of the mega mammals at the end of the ice age. And of course, um, we humans have been incredibly impactful on the environment. And uh, this figure, I think, is, is sort of impressive. If we took at the total carbon content of all living things in the world today, it is smaller than the amount of carbon that we've released into the atmosphere since 1870. Um, so human activity is a, a global scale. It is a, a geological scale phenomena these days. But what about ourselves? You know, could we go extinct? I mean. People obviously think about that on occasion. Lots and lots of literature about that. Could we? Well, you know, maybe someday we will have to face something like a supervolcano event or an asteroid impact. And those sorts of traumas um, certainly could disrupt our society in great degrees. 
Um, and it's worth knowing that civilization itself, that is city, city building cultures, are highly specialized systems that do require lots of complex economic resource links. Things like stable food supply, stable energy supply, stable waste management, public health systems, transportation. And exhausting these systems could bring civilization to an end, city building cultures. Um, and if you think about it, a city building culture is a very much a, an ecological specialist. It requires a lot of things that other cultures might not. On the other hand, you know, our modern cultures, our societies, we have lots of smart people trying to figure out different ways of things, of dealing with things. But sort of business as usual is ultimately um, a non-sustainable factor, at least on global scales. Uh, a purely extractive culture um, is eventually going to run out of resources, um, at least on the planet. Um, and so we would have to ultimately start getting resources on from other worlds if we could, but that's not going to benefit the many. Um, and these, you know, so even, even renewable resources re renew at certain rates, and if you use them faster than those rates, you're not going to be able to get them. So, you know, we don't want to eat the earth. In contrast, though, many people in technology fields and environmental fields today are, you know, thinking about how do you revision uh, the way that we work our economics and we work our technology, something that more closely approximates ecosystems rather than purely extractive systems. So a focus on, on uh, the cycling of resources in society rather than purely extraction, on uh, diversification of things like your energy, where you're getting your energy, not just from one or two things, but make it diverse, your food resources from many diverse factors and so forth. Think about new ways of dealing with our wastes and so forth. And such a civilization could last a lot longer. It's not a purely extractive, but rather a cyclical or uh, regenerative civilization. And it's worth noting that humanity is not civilization. Um, we are not just city builders. Most of our history, we weren't city builders. In fact, half of the age of agriculture had already occurred before the first cities. So people could last longer than civilization. Um, and indeed, a forager that is a hunter-gatherer society or uh, an agrarian society, in the past, they've persisted for millennia. So by definition, they have achieved sustainable ways of life, at least for the parameters of the situation that they were in, because they were sustaining themselves over very long periods of time. In fact, the ones who didn't demonstrated the lack of sustainability. Um, and so a potential, even after a huge global disaster, could be that, that humanity survives even if civilization itself is knocked back and like after a mass extinction event may take a while to rebuild back up from the survivors. Um, a, a other approach might survive, survive for a lot longer periods of time and indeed there is some wisdom from cultures like this that maybe can be incorporated into uh, a technological civilization as well. So with that, uh, if you're interested in other online material in paleontology and so forth, I've got uh, public lectures linked to my YouTube. This one will eventually be on there. Uh, my dinosaur lecture series is there. Some of I and my colleagues have put uh, a bunch of this stuff together uh, from video tours of museums and so forth. And with that, uh, if you have any questions, uh, and also I've got, you know, if you wanted questions and you're looking at this asynchronously or, or what have you, you can contact me and I will try to answer you. So I thank you for your attention and hope you enjoyed it. All right, I don't know if you have any questions, either in person or online. Go for it, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about the um, earlier uh, paleontologists that were looking at the fossil record and mm -hmm. saying, hey, it looks like mass extinctions. Although, as you touched on later in your talk about um, you know, creatures that don't um, leave fossils, mm -hmm. how did they kind of untangle that to say, oh, it isn't just that the creatures don't leave fossils, it's that they've been wiped out? Right. So the question was about how um, uh, this sort of debate early in paleontology of were this, these discontinuities in the history of life, were these representing catastrophes in the history of life, or were they simply the byproduct of there being missing data, and because of that, 
um, we didn't see the gradual shift from one to another, and it looked as preserved as if it was a huge discontinuity. The main lines of evidence um, that shifted it to recognizing rapid changes was the ability to do numerical dating, the ability to figure out the ages of the rocks themselves. Uh, and not nearly just the, um, the actual radiometric dates, but other, date, other um, aspects of stratigraphy, of the reading of rocks, where by plotting out distributions of the appearance and disappearance of index fossils from different sections, when you're comparing them together, you can see if there's a gap represented there. And with enough of that data, both from the, the numerical dating and the biostratigraphic dating, people were able to go back to these discontinuities and see that there weren't huge gaps in time uh, of the scale of millions of years or tens of millions of years, um, that in fact it was a lot, lot shorter. Um, and that sort of got people into, by the mid 20th century, then thinking about maybe mass extinctions are a phenomenon that need an explanation. Um, I'll point out that uh, people like Darwin, who, who didn't accept mass extinctions, or what we would now call mass extinctions, um, in order to explain how different the creatures were, say, between the Permian and the Triassic, or the uh, Cretaceous and the Cenozoic, uh, thought that the gaps that were missing were bigger than the intervals of time beforehand. Like the, so that the gap between the Cretaceous and the Cenozoic uh, was bigger than the Mesozoic era. Uh, and that, that gave sufficient time for things to look so dramatically different. And at a time when the people were just beginning to understand geology, that was a perfectly good and reasonable uh, alternative model and that a lot of science went on to sort of choose between these models. Also online, by the way, we have a few um, Canadians uh, joining us. So oh, great. I'm saluting them uh, from the United States. <laughs> All <here>. right. <laughs> um, uh, one of them has mentioned about uh, the book from a few years ago, The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs. And apparently there, there might be a contrast with what you described in terms of how long extinctions, these mass extinctions unfold? I'm trying to remember what, uh, Rise and Fall of Dinosaurs, I think that's Brusati's book. What that's he was, right. Yeah, what he was saying in there um, about uh, some of these events. Um, and different ones do seem to occur on sort of different paces. I mean, the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event seems to be, as I said, Earth's worst day ever. That there were um, the consequences of it. Uh, certainly extended for tens of thousands of years, but was a real sh uh, rapid shock, whereas something like even the intense Permo-Triassic event, it wasn't the day of the first eruption you had this 96% extinction rate. It would have been really nasty times for many, many, many generations of organisms. Now, there is a long ongoing debate, which remains unresolved, uh, and I don't have I won't say I don't have a dog in the fight. I haven't, I haven't seen either side present decisively strong data on it of whether or not dinosaurs, for instance, in particular, were in decline on the way up to the boundary. Um, some statistical models suggest that they were, and there's good scientists involved in those. Some statistical models suggest that they weren't, and there are also good scientists involved with that. So it's a matter of trying to figure out which of the models best approximates nature and how we figure, are going to figure that out before that, um, that's decided. Now, there definitely is overturn and loss of groups on the way up to any boundary. And that is basically in going back to what Darwin and others were talking about. There is always background extinction going on. So, for instance, among the horned dinosaurs, it's only one branch of the horned dinosaurs that makes it all the way up to the boundary. The ones with the long central ho nose horn, they had died out beforehand. Too early for it to have been the Decon Traps, too early for it to have been uh, the Chicxulub Impactor. Um, but that doesn't mean, because we lost Centrosaurines, that, uh, that the Chicxulub wasn't a, a decisive factor. And the, the brow-horned ones, like Triceratops, presumably would have kept on going if it weren't for uh, the big extinction. Another online question sure. in terms of classifying mass extinctions. For example, would there be 
oh, this one is an ocean-based um, ex mass extinction. This other one is land-based. Um, you know, it, what, what, right. what about that type of thought? So you're trying to subdivide mass extinctions. I, I suppose some people have, have tried to approach ways of potentially categorizing them. The, the big five, well, the, the, uh, the later three of the big five, are both terrestrial and marine, and both have major, uh, major transformations of both the terrestrial and the marine communities. Um, and if, in particular, the Permo-Triassic and the Cretaceous-Paleogene, profound transformations of the marine realm as well as the terrestrial. The Triassic-Jurassic Jurassic one, fairly big in the marine, more profound on land. The earlier ones seem to be less profound in terms of the terrestrial extinctions, but as I mentioned, in the case of the Ordovician one, that's because there wasn't a lot of options. Uh, the land, diver land communities weren't that diverse yet. In the case of the Devonian one, it, that one seems to be primarily a marine. We don't see a big terrestrial signal on it. Um, so you know, there's some people who you know, also try to subdivide them based on you know, maybe the length of the extinction event, in which case you know, the KPG is the outlier and all the others are sort of similar. Um, or, you know, is it volcano versus something else? But there's still a lot of work to be done. And as I said, even what is the, what, how we count what are the big extinctions is a matter of debate. There's some suggestion, for instance, that there is an extinction before the Permo-Triassic one in the Permian, which is nevertheless nevertheless still one of the biggest mass extinctions in Earth history. And that's sort of in the shadow of the Permo-Triassic, um, it, it, it's, it's been sort of, the glare of it, it's been sort of lost. And that even if you separate them out as two extinctions, they wind up being the worst and second worst mass extinction, so. Well, another of our participants is asked about our own time. You know, mm -hmm. we're in the sixth, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Was there anything noteworthy between the fifth and sixth? The noteworthy extinctions, not necessarily re meeting the mass extinction. Sure, there's some big, yeah, there are some big environmental crises and extinctions in between. So in between the, the one at the end of the age of dinosaurs and today. Um, about just 10 million years after the, the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction, so at 56 million years ago, there's this big degassing from the seafloor. It looks like it's associated with the rifting apart between Greenland and Europe. Um, that causes um, a, a major global warming episode. Not as strong, any, nowhere near as strong as the Triassic-Jurassic and definitely not as strong as the um, uh, Permo-Triassic. Uh, but what's curious about this one, it's called the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum. It is just about the same amount of greenhouse gases liberated as the business as usual model for uh, contemporary gr greenhouse warming. And so a lot of climatologists and paleoclimatologists have studied this PETM event as a potential model. Um, and that one is associated with some regional extinctions uh, and both land and sea. Uh, and also because the temperatures got so warm at the polar regions, animals and plants that were more tropical were able to make their way over out of Asia into Europe and into North America by polar passages. So it's sort of like an invasive species effect, only without the effect of humans. So um, natural invasive species, if you will. And then there's another major extinction when Antarctica is finally rifted far enough away from Australia and Tasmania on one side and from South America on the other that you get the circumantarctic uh, current, which is today one of the major drivers of climate because you get some water that gets trapped around Antarctica, it gets colder and colder, it gets super cold, it gets dense, it plunges down to form the Antarctic bottom water, and as it's going down, it's a major sink for CO2. It pulls down lots of CO2, which remains on the seafloor, and there's a huge global cooling and drying event. It sort of changes the world from a greenhouse world to a, an ice house world, not quite an ice age yet, um, and that drying and cooling has a big effect in the marine realm and also in the terrestrial realm. A question of my own. Um, sure. It, you know, there's, there's cause for optimism as far as us uh, you know, preventing future catastrophes on a global scale. The you know, deflection of asteroids, mm -hmm. uh, just even detecting all of them and so on. Uh, but 
you mentioned super volcanism. I don't think there's anything we can do to prevent or somehow um, minimize their expression, I guess you'd say. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, maybe we can protect populations somehow, but uh, it seems like that one's a killer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The, um, so the idea being, you know, if we were to, I still want to see, like, it, it would be a sad one, a, a, a disaster movie where it's called flood basalt. You know, it's a major new eruption, new flood basalt's going to happen, and they, you know, the, the, the president and the, the military go to the scientists, okay, is there anything we could do? Well, not really. Can we <laughs> blow it up with nuclear weapons? Well, you could blow up with nuclear weapons. Will they do anything? No. Um, as far as we know, yeah, we don't really know that much about how you could deflect um, or you know, stop something of that scale from coming out. And as you say, probably the best response would be shoring up, making resilient, you know, enough of the food resources, the population, the infrastructure, et cetera, to keep on going through those times. Um, long, sort of longer scale, you know, the more planets or worlds we're on, the, the better the chance that we and whatever par other parts of our biosphere we take with us can survive, not, not have all, all of your eggs in one basket. Um, but Mm -hmm. More of a technical problem, there. right? But uh, yeah, I think um, you know there's, there, there are options. They're just not very easy. Exactly. Yeah, that's the yeah, life is tough. <laughs> the point a lot of people like to make is to make Mars habitable, take tech, more technological resources that we would be better to spend them on the Earth. You know, right? Yeah. Because Mars is just. I mean, the soil is is you know it's not soil. It's it's dirt. Mm -hmm. Audience member Tom, a, who, a fellow employee at Goddard Space Flight Center, uh, said that terraforming Mars is much more expensive than anything we can do to help Earth. Yeah. So that's sort of the counter argument. Yeah. There. Um, uh, another question came up uh, regarding our sixth extin mm -hmm. extinction event. Is there a, a rough start date of when that you would mark that? Yeah, that's a good question, and and that's. Um, some people would say that the idea of the sixth extinction, you know, we could potentially say that the Pleistocene megafaunal extinctions are the first wave. Um, you know, granted, those are, you know, say 40,000 years ago or so in Australia and about 13,000 years ago here in the Americas and scattered at other times in other parts of the world. Um, Maybe, you know, and certainly from a, the standpoint of tens of millions of years away, that would look like almost instantaneous with what's going on now. Uh, alternatively, maybe you could argue the mid-19th century, um, when we start to see the beginnings of larger scale industrialization. Uh, that's around the time we begin to get the collapse of, say, the uh, bison herds of North America. We, at that point, are wiping out uh, the passenger pigeons um, and so forth. Um, 20th century is another time you could say that. It, it's during the 20th century that we begin to have a signal on the sort of geochemical record of the Earth. So for instance, nowadays, uh, for the last several decades, um, humans have been the largest factor in the nitrogen fixation cycle mm -hmm. in nature. That prior to that, it's things like um, certain plants and lightning were the largest factors, but now our industrial fixation of nitrogen is on a bigger scale than the, uh, than the natural occurring systems. Um, so, um, you know, I would prefer to say instead of marking the beginning of the sixth extinction, we could sort of mark that we see the beginnings of it and therefore try to turn the corner so we don't get to count it. Uh, <laughs> Someone here says they're going to email you about a particular movie that has, uh, quote, uh, the continents are melting uh, <laughs> into magma and so on. I'm going to speculate uh, that person's thinking of crack in the world. Um, oh, I wonder, there might yeah. might be uh, some other ones, uh, but that I'm familiar with that one. Um, yeah. Let's see, do we have any questions? Oh, yes. Uh, wasn't there a finding in the diversity of human DNA that shows that it's so low that the human population must have shrank down to just a few thousand sometime in the past? 
was that caused by some kind of stressor that almost eventually lent, led to human extinction? Yeah, so the, um, there's this uh, observation that yeah, human genetic uh, diversity is lower than you might expect for a population of our size, even well, historically, you know, obviously for, 18, for, rather for 8 billion people or nearly 8 billion. Uh, um, that's, a, that's a lot of people. But, um, the, um, and some of the ge uh, genetic modelers have suggested it was down to just like a few hundreds or thousands of people after the origin of our species, but well before modern time. And some of the dates I've seen have been like around 70,000 years ago. Um, and that maybe that's a byproduct of some environmental disaster. And some people pointed to some of the eruptions in Indonesia, uh, the large scale ones. They're even bigger than, say, the Tambora eruption of the 18 teens uh, that could have reduced the population. I'm not enough of a geneticist to know the, the details on that, but it sounds not unreasonable. There's, we are not the only species for which that's a factor. Cheetahs, for instance, have so have incredibly low genetic diversity. And I've, I've heard a, um, a veterinarian surgeon who worked with zoos who's pointed out that almost any cheetah in the world can accept a skin graft from any other cheetah. And that suggests that they are all extremely closely related, very, very low uh, genetic diversity. So it looks like cheetahs may have also gone through a big population crash. It would be interesting to see if it's around the same time. Um, but whatever it was, that disaster didn't leave a huge scale record in the Earth system. There probably are records of ash falls from around that time that we could see. As I, as I said, there's stuff from Indonesia, but um, nothing uh, comparable to the stuff that happens with the Big Five. That's orders of magnitude larger. And even the great big um, super volcano eruptions of the Yellowstone caldera that have happened, uh, several of them in the last two million years, leave a great record in North America. And you see bits and traces of it beyond that, but it's far finer events than we see uh, in the modern world. I mean, something like that, something like that could have produced huge, uh, would, could, if it happened today, would be a hugely devastating thing to our society, um, at least short term, but, um, but didn't seem to be responsible for uh, extinctions of species, certainly not a mass extinction. Ah, there's a Thank you, it was a great talk. I really Thanks. appreciate it. Um, as a University of Maryland graduate, 81, in geology, oh, I really appreciate it. Um, oh, great. <laughs> I was wondering if anybody has done any modeling that since the most recent of the big five, 66 million mm. years ago, if that asteroid were a few degrees off mark and had missed, has anybody done any modeling you can point at about what the world would have looked like with its population of plants, animals, etc., and where we would be. Sure. So, um, no one, to my knowledge, has done like rigorous modeling of it, but there definitely have been lots of sort of speculative zoology on exactly that topic, um, and um, including there have been a couple of popular audience. Well, this one popular audience book, and there used to be a great uh, website from back in the early 2000s, but the people involved with it all had to eventually get jobs and things and no longer maintain it, uh, and, and so forth. But yeah, the, um, and, and then uh, the, 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 the one book I'm thinking of, firstly, is uh, Dougal Dixon's The New Dinosaurs. Um, and Dougal Dixon is a paleontologist and zoologist who's done a number of books about sort of speculative zoology, speculative biology. Um, and then there was a, another paleontologist, sort of regional to here, uh, Greg Paul, who um, did a review, and I think his version of the speculative dinosaurs were even better. But Greg is a dinosaur specialist, so that makes sense. Um, we could, you know, presumably the groups of dinosaurs that were doing okay and the groups of other organisms that were doing okay at 67 million years ago would have made it through. Uh, and so what we could think about are what were some of the factors that they would still have to deal with. So they would have to survive through the relatively warm times, which are not dissimilar to what they were used to, of the early Cenozoic, but then this global cooling and drying event. And so eventually would have to adapt to the great grasslands that evolved, uh, 
Um, presumably, again, we have the origin of various new groups, subgroups within these, and maybe some of those might outcompete some of the other animals. That said, I think it fair to say, given that dinosaurs and mammals appear almost the same time in the geologic record, and that mammals were doing perfectly well as small-bodied animals and utterly non-existent as medium and large-bodied animals throughout the Mesozoic, that that would have continued. And so we would have had diverse small mammals of various sorts, burrowers and flyers and tree climbers and swimmers and so forth, but that the large-bodied and medium-sized animals on land would be primarily dinosaurs and uh, croc relatives and so forth. Yeah. What's your favorite time in geologic history? Oh, what's my favorite time in geologic history? That's an easy one to answer, uh, and that's the late Cretaceous, and especially the Maastrichtian, so the very end of the Cretaceous, the time of Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops and so forth. Uh, you know, it's all fascinating, it's all wonderful, but I am a, a real fan of the end of the Cretaceous. Before, th before this happens, but, uh, but up to that point, I think it's really cool. Yeah. Question back there. You talk so much about the extinctions of macroscopic life. Is mm -hmm. just microscopic life so diverse that it's difficult to just, just justify how their extinctions come and go? So yeah, a uh, question about extinctions in microscopic groups. There definitely are extinctions in microscopic groups. Um, as, as you do point out, um, they, they tend to be so diverse or, or maybe are doing so well it is hard to knock them out. But for instance, at the um, Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event, there is a huge loss in terms of diversity of a couple of the major groups of microorganisms, the coccolithophorids, which are the chalk forming organisms. They're single celled photosynthesizers that, had, that have little plates in their uh, protoplasm that look like hubcaps. And basically when the protoplasm dies, those hubcaps accumulate on the seafloor, and if you've got enough of it accumulating, we call that limestone chalk. They get clobbered, and they never recover in terms of their diversity. We still have them, or the, either their diversity or their abundance. So either the number of species or how many individuals per you know, unit volume. They never recover from that. We still have them today, but we don't get chalk forming in later parts of Earth history. They get knocked back really far. But then... Um, Another group that gets clobbered at the time are the foraminiferans, which are basically like shelled amoebas. Um, they get knocked back, but they get up again, like the song says, only they get up again like gangbusters, and they are doing better in the Cenozoic than they were in the Mesozoic. So they, they recover quite strongly. Um, and there are a handful of groups of microorganisms that have died out in Earth history, but not terribly much. So that's one reason people don't talk about them as much. The other is, other thing is, the public generally doesn't know about them. Yeah. So you have to go through the whole explanation of what the heck they are, and then explain that they died out. So. Yes, a follow-up to that is, yeah. what does that say about uh, extraterrestrial microscopic life having a chance of survival in more extreme situations? Sure. So, um, my, and as and. As a microbiologist would tell you, you know, the diversity of habitats that a microorganism can survive in, depending on which sort of organism it is, is vastly larger than things that large multicellular organisms can survive in. We, we have too many requirements. We need things to be just right for us compared to the, th the environments that a, a bacterium or an archaean can survive in. And for a number of reasons, statistically, we would expect most of the life in the universe to be the comparable to a bacterium or an archaean. For one thing, that's the greatest, that's, that's how life begins. It's going to have to begin really simple. So that's the starting point. Um, and because multicellular things have a lot of you know, special requirements, e even on other worlds, we would expect there to be a lot more simple single-celled forms than the equivalent to multicelled forms. And just you know, by time-wise, if you were randomly sampling Earth history, you know, the first half of it, nothing more complex than a bacterium, and then the second, sorry, the third quarter of that, nothing much more complex than an amoeba. Um, so it's only been far more recently that we've had multicellular animal grade life on Earth, and so if you think about it, if we're randomly sampling other worlds, it's probably pretty likely 
that most of them are slime worlds. So, uh, you know, I don't know that if even Captain Kirk and his loneliness would want to seduce some, you know, bacterium on some world. Uh, but that's what's going to be more likely to find, you know, the strange new worlds and that you're going to encounter are going to be a lot more of them that are going to look like Earth in the Archean period than are going to look like Earth in the Pleistocene. Have there been extinction events for insects, arthropods? Ah, arthropods, definitely. I mean, the, the poster children for that is the trilobites, mm -hmm. uh, one of the great groups of the Paleozoic that doesn't make it out of the Permo-Triassic extinction. In fact, the trilobites get knocked back after each of the first big three, and it's the third one that finally takes them out. Um, they're a great example of a group that gets knocked back and doesn't get back up again. Mm -hmm. uh, and the contrast, the, the ammonoids, the spiral-shelled cephalopods, after each major extinction they experienced, they got crashed, they came back better than ever. Crashed better than ever, and then finally after the Cretaceous, they didn't come back. Um, insects, they get, there are actual major groups of insects that die out at the Permo-Triassic extinction. That's the only one that's definitively known to have major groups that are wiped out. But there's some question about the Cretaceous uh, Paleogene, or for that matter, the Triassic, Jurassic one, because our sampling of insect diversity is really sporadic. And basically, when you find amber sites, that's, those sites represent like 90% of our knowledge of fossil insect groups. Mm. And so, for instance, there's a huge number of recently discovered groups of insects from about 100 million years ago, from amber in Burma, in Myanmar, um, that do not make, that, that are not present as far as we know in the Cenozoic, from Cenozoic ambers. And the question is, did they die out somewhere between 100 million years ago and 66? Or maybe some of these groups make their way up to 66 and then get wiped out then, and we just don't have the data yet to show that. One thing we can say about the Triassic, sorry, the, the, the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event is that in the leaf deposits for several thousand years afterwards, the amount of insect damage goes down. So the world was in such a way that insects aren't common enough to be tearing up leaves the way they used to. And that, I think, is impressive because it would take a lot to knock insects back. One of our participants thought of the movie title. That oh. It wasn't Cracked in the World. It was. <laughs> 2012 was the name of the movie. 2012, yeah. Remember, the world was supposed to end in December of that year. Right. And next year will mark the 10th anniversary of that's, the world ending. That's right, um, exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah, I, I, I did also want to throw in this question about, um, you know, a, can invasive species cause an extinction? I would. You know, one of our participants has brought up that concept. Sure. Invasive species can definitely cause an extinction, but it's unlikely to cause a mass extinction. So we've seen, for instance, on uh, many islands uh, around the world as, um, as people, whether it's you know, the, uh, the, the Polynesian expansion uh, throughout the Pacific and Indian Oceans or the uh, uh, Western expansion later on, that rats or other organisms that people either intentionally or unintentionally carried with them make it to those islands. The local animals uh, are just get totally outcompeted or overhunted. Uh, I think it's a Guam where there was some snake, I believe, that was brought in from either South America or Asia that is devastating the bird populations there, some of which have gone extinct. Um, humans, when we've arrived in Hawaii, there's an extinction of birds. Uh, actually, there's an extinction of birds in many island communities when humans arrive. Um, so, yeah, you could definitely get extinctions with invasives. Um, presumably, some of those might still go on with some of these really, really uh, effective invaders, like some of the, the zebra mussels and so forth. Um, but, um, but those don't rise to the level of a mass extinction. I think we'll take one more question here. Okay, okay. Got to make this one count. Uh, in terms of looking at the after extinctions, has there been any um, star examples of any species that's been very resilient to survive many mass extinctions? For example, tardigrades. Sure. So there certainly are groups of organisms uh, that have been super resilient to extin extinction. So tardigrades as a group have survived a lot. Now, I don't know that any one individual species of tardigrade has been through a lot. Uh, what the, 
sort of the mimetic version, the meme one, is horseshoe crabs. Uh, horseshoe crabs as a group originate in the Cambrian, so they've survived all five of the big five. Uh, and in fact, horseshoe crabs that would look like modern horseshoe crabs are around in the Triassic, so they survived at least the ones that would look pretty much the same uh, to what you and I see as a horseshoe crab, and if we go out to the, you know, the beaches here, through the Triassic, Jurassic, and the Cretaceous, Paleogene. There are still different species in the modern ones, but they are, as a group, really similar and doing similar things. Um, and then on a broad scale, um, the cyanobacteria, or of some of the other microorganisms, the cyanobacteria, the blue-green algae of today, anatomically look pretty much the same that we find from, you know, chert deposits of 1.8 billion years ago or so. Um, and although there's a lot of speciation within that group, the basics of them haven't changed very much over time. So. All right. Thank you so much. Oh, great. Thank Thanks. you to everyone online and here who participated. So next time, uh, we'll see you online, not in this room, online only. That'll be Saturday, January 8th. Benjamin Radford of Skeptical Inquirer magazine will discuss his recent book, Big, If True, Adventures in Oddity. It's a science-based examination of 70 mysteries. I don't think he'll cover all of those, but including Bigfoot, reincarnation, chupacabras, Icelandic elves, the goat man, a little uh, local interest there, um, uh, conspiracy theories, UFOs, plus a 1990 Elvis Presley sighting. That's <laughs> Saturday, January 8th at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 18.30 Universal Time, online. Don't come to this room. There'll probably be a rehearsal of Macbeth or something. Um, thanks again to Thomas Holtz. Thanks to J.D. Mack for producing today's program. And thanks for joining us. Enjoy the holidays. Happy New Year. See you next time. Bye-bye.